It was a fantastic day in the stock market with most indices up well over 1%. Not only that, but market breadth was fantastic. We saw that about 93 or 94% of the stocks out there closed in the green with only 7% in the red. So this was a broad-based advance with all 11 sectors higher here today. Not only that, but we're getting nice bounces up and off of important support areas. And all of this comes, of course, on the eve of a big speech from Jerome Powell and company tomorrow at Jackson Hole. So we'll see if he can add further fuel to the fire or if he throws a big cold wet blanket on top of this market rally. But for the most part, today was quite a bullish session and bodes well for those of you who want strength as we head into the fall. Tonight's trade application example focuses on the real estate sector and when we find a stock that has been outperforming the market, bouncing up and off of a rising 30-day moving average and is in a nice position to benefit from a one-for-one -one reward risk relationship. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Z. It's August 25th, 2022. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into our description area. Make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. You'll also see at the bottom of those emails which stocks are giving you overbought or oversold cluster signals within the S&P 500. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me. My handle is at Brandon Van Z. We really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these market outlook related posts. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's jump into today's trade activity. And my oh my, looks like St. Patrick's Day out there. Lots of green, lots of leprechauns jumping around just the way that you like to see it. If you want to be bullish in these markets, uh, uh, you know, there really wasn't much in the way of interference here today. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week and then also Tuesday when I was with you, where the hope is that once we've had our pullback, which we did here a week or so ago, that we would start to find stability around the rising 30-day moving average on the S&P 500. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we've done. We'll, we'll take a look at the chart here, of course, a little bit later. But uh, when we've had a couple of bounce days in a row, like we have both yesterday and today, this is the end result. It's a beautiful picture here. Uh, now, I uh, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, we have a big day tomorrow in front of us. And it's possible that uh, if Jerome Powell says the wrong thing at Jackson Hole, uh, maybe he throws a big cold wet blanket on top of this whole party right here. But for at least today, uh, we can rejoice. This was an overwhelmingly bullish day, uh, probably even more so than the final um, statistics or the final uh, percentage would 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 suggest. Uh, we were up over 1% today, which was a nice day without a doubt, but this wasn't one of those big like 3 or 4% up days. But when you look at the breadth here, it kind of felt like it, right? This, this was an overwhelming victory for the bulls here today uh, with very little uh, selling pressure taking place out there. Um, one thing I did want to point out is this Tesla is a little bit um, inaccurate here. Now remember, this is the Thinkorswim platform, so I have no uh, no say over how they handle things. Uh, that's up to them. Uh, but just merely pointing out uh, that Tesla was not down 66% here today. Uh, if that were the case and the rest of the market would be up like this, uh, yeah, I would have told you we were probably, uh, you, you were in my dream or in a nightmare or something along those lines, because that's just not reality. Um, Tesla uh, had their stock split here today. So that's the reason it appears like it's down 66% in price. Uh, but in truth, uh, Tesla was just down fractionally here today. So it was down, uh, but hardly. Um, you know, a, a big deal at all. Uh, more important, I guess you could say, would be this red square over here, or rectangle, and this was Dollar Tree. That was a true number where it was down 10% today off of an earnings announcement. You also had a negative reaction to Salesforce's earnings announcement. That stock was down 3% today, and that's a pretty important company, all things considered, so that had a slight impact. Bristol Myers Squibb uh, was down about a percent. Um, and uh, we saw pay uh, checks uh, down fractionally. But as I look at these various sectors out there, really there was only one sector that had maybe a consistent red hue to it, 
and uh, I would say that was consumer staples. If I right click there and zoom into only the consumer staples, you can see that there were enough uh, kind of red or maroon squares out there to at least pose somewhat of a fight. But that was the only sector. All of the other sectors uh, were consistently green. Uh, by the way, some of you that follow me on Twitter might have seen here just a moment ago, I was tweeting about, where is it? There it is. Uh, MO, Altria, uh, just announced their dividend increase here of about 4.4%. So their yield will actually go up to about 8% uh, at this point. So uh, pretty high yield in this marketplace, all things considered. Um, but you can see that a, a few of these did close in the green. Estee Lauder had a nice 4% up move here today uh, to offset some of the weakness from others like uh, Molson Coors was down over a percent, Kraft Heinz was down about a percent, uh, General Mills was down about a percent. But those are pretty modest numbers, right? These are not anything that's going to derail the market. Those aren't important enough companies in the grand scheme of things to do that. So as we head back to the S&P 500 now, um, you know, it's hard for me to point out any one sector that was consistently bullish because most of these, quite frankly, were consistently bullish. Uh, we did have some, I would say, positive news there on NVIDIA. Uh, it was up 4% uh, here today. And in the after hours and extended hours sessions here after they reported their earnings yesterday and then even earlier this morning, their share price was down significantly. For those of you that, that track my nine at nine every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time, uh, which is basically looking at the most important large cap companies that are either up or down a half an hour before the market opens, NVIDIA was one of those on the negative side of the nine at nine. And so it seemed to me at that point that we should expect NVIDIA to have a rough session, but uh, you know the market uh, had other plans for it and actually ended up closing it higher by 4%, making it one of the better performers on the market today, at least from kind of that more mega cap perspective. We were actually talking about NVIDIA a little bit today in my question and answer session for my premium students at Market Scholars when we were talking about how NVIDIA is three times larger than uh, Intel these days from a market cap perspective. And I'd imagine uh, a lot of people, if you just pulled them randomly on Main Street USA, would never guess that's the case, but it's the truth. Uh, of the semiconductors out there these days, NVIDIA is um, considered the most important from a market cap perspective. So it was great to see them uh, kind of pull themselves up out of their uh, early morning struggles and actually support this market when it was all said and done. Um, so lots of green out there. Again, hard to, to point out one area or another because let's be honest, it's, uh, it's green across the board. So one of those beautiful days uh, if you're a bull. All right, let's go ahead and pop back on over to the main part of the platform and wanted to show you another uh, measure of breadth. Remember, you can come over here to the Market Watch tab on the Thinkorswim platform and then instead of going to the normal quotes area, click on this visualize area instead and then in this drop down right here, select the, um, the index watch instead of the heat map like we were looking at just a moment ago. And then once you're there, you can use um, your different personal watch list or you can go to the public watch list to pull up the S&P 500, which I've done here in this case. And you can see that of the stocks in the S&P 500, at least the ones uh, that are suggested to be in the S&P 500 by Thinkorswim, so I don't know uh, how how much they maintain and upkeep this. So there might be a slight delay when some companies enter in and some others get kicked out. But for the most part, it gives us a, a pretty good sense of what's happening within the index. So of the approximate 500 stocks in the S&P 500, uh, 468 of them closed higher here today. So again, another sense of an overwhelming victory for the bulls. That is good for about 93 or 94% of the stocks in the S&P 500 closed positively today with just a handful, only 36 closing in the red, which many of those were in the consumer staples area. And as much as I personally love the consumer staples as a dividend growth investor, uh, I always say that I'm willing to sacrifice uh, my happiness for the good of the rest of the market. Isn't that special of me? Uh, just joking, of course. But what I mean by that is um, if the consumer staples are out of favor on a particular day like they were today, 
that's actually a joyous occasion for the market at large because the consumer staples are oftentimes viewed as kind of the stalwarts, the blue chips, the area that you go to run to and hide from the market when it's crashing. Uh, and on a day like today, uh, when that is one of the only areas out of favor, it's giving you the very strong impression that today was very much a risk on day, not a risk off day. So uh, a great, great session for the vast majority of stocks out there. Since we were up over 1% here today, let's also take a look here at chart 6D for those of you that are premium members following along at home. Um, I usually like to look at this chart with you guys here if the market is either up or down uh, at least 1%. And so today was one of those up 1% days and you can see how that looks here in the middle of the screen where we've got this green bar stretching up and over this blue horizontal line here and uh, there is the color-coded labels here to help remind you of what those different horizontal lines uh, represent and the, 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 the blue line is a 1% move there. And you can see this is our first 1% up move on the market since right back over here on August 12th. Um, and so it's been a, a little bit of time, a couple of weeks since we had a day where it, we, we saw this much strength within the market. And uh, you can see that we closed near the high of the session, fairly similar to what we did back on that day uh, as well. Now naturally when the markets are roaring higher like they were today, all else being equal you should assume that the VIX, the volatility index, should be lower on a day like that. And of course that is the case here. The VIX fell down to 21. However, I might add that given the strength in the market today, you might have expected the VIX to fall below 20. After all, it was just at 20 here a week or so ago. Um, and so that kind of gives you the impression that while today was certainly a robust day from a breadth perspective, there's probably still some holdouts out there that are thinking that uh, the Fed might very well ruin the party tomorrow. Uh, and therefore, they're kind of keeping their uh, hedged bets on and uh, keeping some pressure on the put prices out there that is then reflected within the VIX itself. So anyway, um, VIX did fall today, but maybe not as drastically as you would assume, given the fact that 94% of the stocks in the S&P 500 closed in the green here today. All right, let's go ahead and now pop on over to our typical routine, starting with our four grid, so that way we can get a sense of postures, moving averages, and the like. So um, let's talk it through. S&P 500 was up 1.41% today. The Dow Jones was today's laggard. It was up 0.98% today, so just below 1%. The NASDAQ was today's leader, it was up 1.67%, and the Russell 2000 was just a shade below that at an advance of 1.52%. And that's really probably the order that I would prefer to see if I want to see really robust bullish activity. Uh, the NASDAQ is oftentimes viewed as a little bit more speculative, right? That's where you're going to have a lot of your tech stocks and your up and coming companies. Uh, Russell 2000 is also somewhat speculative because it involves, um, you know, the smaller companies that are out there. And then the two big blue chip indices up there at the top usually are going to um, be relative laggards on a very robust up day, um, especially the Dow, because that's where you're really going to have your, your, your major blue chip stocks, right? There's only 30 stocks on the Dow. Um, the S&P 500 is a little bit different because these days with um, technology sector being the most influential of it, um, it does kind of compare a little bit more closely to the NASDAQ these days than it has in decades of the past. Uh, nevertheless, um, a pretty strong reaction here today. And um, I, I, again, don't want to jinx this, but this is exactly what I am looking for out of the markets, or at least this was the response I was hoping to receive from the markets. And again, I shared those thoughts with you in this very presentation last week. When I said that, yes, markets are strong, we will inevitably have a pullback, and I'm less interested in that because I know a pullback will happen. It's just a matter of when. What I'm more interested in is how does the market react when we get the pullback? And that's why I'm excited here today because this is exactly how I want the market to react, what we've seen the last couple of days here. Remember when I was with you on Tuesday, I was pointing out 
where we were. So this was Tuesday, the candle right here on the S&P 500 that I'm circling with my mouse. So that's when I was with you last. David was with you yesterday. So when I was with you on Tuesday, I was pointing out how we had cut into this congestion zone back here on the S&P 500 from the end of May into early June. And I specifically pointed out these two candles right there. So that would have been June 1st and June 2nd. And I pointed out how the lows on those candles were 40.73 and 40.74. So basically equal lows on those two days at the lows of their price activity. And I was mentioning how I'd like to see the market pull back to around somewhere around that rising 30 day moving average and not breach those lows of those two candles over there, have some resilience and actually bounce back in the opposite direction. And that's exactly what we've seen so far. Now again, we gotta be careful. This is not the time when we run victory laps. We hardly ever get to do that unless we of course have options expire uh, the way that we want them to or whatever where there's an actual expiration period. Uh, the stock market itself is an ongoing marathon that you always have to be a participant within and you always have to be careful uh, getting too giddy because the market does a good job of humbling you along the way. But um, if I had uh, a wish, you know, back here as we started rolling over, the wish would have been fulfilled here within the last couple of days as we basically closed at the high of the session today with an overwhelming victory for the bulls, a 93% day for the bulls there in the S&P 500. So you really couldn't have asked for much more. This is what you want, a 1.4% up move, closing at the highs, close above the high of the low day, did not breach those prior lows, did not breach this upward trending 30-day moving average. You know, all of that is in the bullish camp. One little fly in the ointment is that you do have a weekly bearish intermediate posture at this moment in time, and that's why you do have that light pink background color. Um, that is happening because this green line, the intermediate line, has fallen out of the upper reversal zone and has cut below 80. And remember, I told you to prepare for that on Tuesday because on Tuesday it hadn't yet happened yet, but I said it could happen within a day or two uh, just because that's where the momentum was taking you. Now I'm gonna say the exact opposite here, which is don't get to um, um, you know, bought into that idea that, hey, now we're weekly bearish. Uh, yes, that's true. That's what the tr that's what the the indicator is telling us. But um, there are lots of indicators out there, and lots of them tell you uh, conflicting you know signals. And so, when the indicator is more influential to me, is when it is um, confirming what the moving averages and the trends are telling us. And right now, there's a conflict there. There's not a confirmation. And so, I'm still willing to give the bulls the benefit of the doubt here. Um, you know, if tomorrow Jerome Powell comes out and says something the market doesn't like and we do end up undercutting those lows of those two candles back there, then I'm willing to change my mind, right? You have to stay flexible in this business if you're trading. Um, but until that happens, I'm going to make the assumption that this rising 30-day moving average is strong enough to support this market. There's still a lot of skepticism out there. I'm in that camp, right? Uh, you know, I, I always say trade what you see, not what you think or, or what your gut is telling you or what have you. What I think and what my gut is telling me is to be a little bit more cautious, but what I see with my eyes is strength in this market. And so um, I think there's a lot of people out there that probably are thinking in the same um, degree and that skepticism of people not wanting to chase the rally and all this kind of stuff is what could very well provide the, you know, the it could be the fire starter, right? I forgive me, I, I just was ca camping last week. Some of you saw my, my pictures on on Twitter. So you need a fire starter to get the, the the logs going, right? Right out of the gate. And perhaps the fire starter in this case is the fact that so many people don't want to believe in this rally. There are so many people that are quite hesitant right here, despite what their eyes are showing them is actually really good strength out of the market since we had at least some sort of a shorter term bottom at the end of June. So, um, you know, we have these presentations pretty much every single trading day and that can change. So it's always important for me to remind you of that. But as of this exact moment in time, I actually like what I see. Um, you know, despite the, the weekly bearish posture, 
Um, this is what I wanted to see out of the markets the last two days. And uh, as long as Jerome Powell doesn't screw things up too much tomorrow, uh, who knows, maybe we can rally into the weekend and uh, maybe we'll have a slightly more bullish tilt heading into the weekend uh, as well. So uh, we had pretty much the same stories candlestick wise across the rest of the indices. So I'm not gonna belabor the point, but just wanna emphasize that we did close basically at the highs or near the highs of the session on all four of these charts today. All four of them also have weekly bearish postures for the moment, at least intermediate postures. Remember their near-term postures are all bullish right now, right? So this blue um, label in the market forecast area, all of them say rising right now. And so those more swing trading um, postures are more bullish and we actually had a good discussion about that yesterday in my swing trading class and we'll probably talk about it a little bit later on in tonight's video as well as we go to uh, the market outlook uh, trade application example um, but um, you know just a reminder that there's a variety of ways that you can s establish your posture uh, the intermediate posture is a little bit more touch and go right now but in the short term from a swing trading perspective uh, it is more bullish right now than bearish out there at least uh, you know given what I'm I'm seeing in the markets right now so anyway a lot of these charts look the same. Uh, they were all up pretty much 1% or more, but not more than 2%, but consistently bullish when you look under the hood at the breadth of the market and uh, all of them above a rising 30-day moving average. None of them breached that moving average on this somewhat gentle pullback that we've had that we've known is it was overdue, right? Markets don't go straight up. So uh, we, we had the pullback uh, that was expected here a week ago, uh, and now we're getting the flip side of that, the response to the pullback. And so far, the response has been very nicely bullish. All right, let's go ahead and step away here and take a look at the internet briefly. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you who are helping support this presentation. Uh, the last time I did the video here on Tuesday, 110 of you stepped up and took the five seconds out of your day to click like to help encourage us to do these videos as often as possible. Obviously, it takes uh, a big commitment to do these videos, multiple hours per day. Uh, and uh, you know, for some of you, they're worthwhile. For others, maybe less so. Maybe it's just something you have on in the background while you're, you're, you're cooking dinner for the family or something. But uh, point being, we always have to ask ourselves honestly, uh, is this worth our while and is it worth the audience's while for us to pour this much um, time and effort into producing these free YouTube videos? And as long as you guys are responding in kind, I'm happy to continue doing them. And as long as we're up and over 100 likes, I'm more than happy to do a full length video there for you. If we're under 100 likes, then that would be a time where I would plan on just doing a shortened 15 minute version without a trade application example. So always let you guys decide collectively. But in general, I think you guys have overwhelmingly given me the impression that you like the uh, longer form videos because there's only been one or two times this entire calendar year where you guys have come in under 100. So keep up the great work there. Many of you are committed to doing that every single time and we really appreciate that. So thank you very much to the 110 of you that did that the last time around. It goes a long ways for us as a very fledgling, small uh, organization, uh, right? We don't have the advertising and uh, marketing budgets that uh, so many other folks have out there. So our way to get the word out about our business is through word of mouth and by doing things like clicking like for us on social media, uh, that's exactly how you can help us in that effort if you're so inclined and thank you very much for doing that. Also, I'm noticing under some of the um, popular recent posts over here, uh, the Thinkorswim uh, tutorial uh, has been viewed quite a bit. We actually talked about that in my uh, question and answer session that I taught today. Uh, and just a friendly reminder because it came up within a question that, um, remember on those dividend stair step charts, uh, that all of you who are premium members have access to, you do need to re-import those at least once per year. Um, and the reason for that is the calculations that build those stair-step lines um, are done outside of the platform on a spreadsheet that I have. So I have to do like you know the, the, the calculations on 700 different stocks and then re-import those once per year. So it's not something where 
Um, you know, you can just import it one time five years ago and think that your numbers today are good to go. They're not. Uh, so I think most of you understand that if you're uh, part of my classes regularly because I, I bring it up enough. But simply because it came up in a conversation today uh, in my question and answer session, and this gives me the platform to reiterate that because um, the, the, the calculations are based off of a rolling 10-year time period, and so they're not static, and they do need to be re-updated uh, once per year. Otherwise, your dividend stair-step charts might be way off depending upon the, uh, the individual security. So friendly reminder on that point, if you haven't done so uh, in a while. I think the last time I did the update was back in March. So if you've done the, uh, the, the, the update on the chart 2A, the dividend stair-step chart, um, since March, you're good to go. Uh, if it's been years since you've done it, then uh, maybe you could use that as an excuse to have a, a weekend project uh, to get that re-uploaded there. And I did talk about it in my Q&A class today, so for those of you that forget how to get to those areas, uh, feel free to listen to my discussion. I think it was George's question here earlier today. Also, David taught his um, portfolio management with ETFs class today. David does a phenomenal job of interpreting macro activity and interpreting what the Fed is saying and then synthesizing that information and um, converting it into uh, very attractive ways to manage a portfolio of ETFs. Uh, it's a little bit different than what many of you probably experienced with us when we were at InvestTools slash TD Ameritrade all those years ago. Back then we also had an ETFs class, but it was driven almost entirely by relative strength, price activity. Uh, David takes a slightly different approach where he's actually taking the information in his belief system and um, slowly transitioning his portfolio based upon what his interpretation of the market is at any given moment in time. So it's a slightly different twist to what some of you will recall from our old ETFs class all those years ago at TD Ameritrade. So make sure you're taking advantage of his knowledge and his uh, skill set within the market there. And then he'll be doing his technical analysis trading room tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you're checking that out as well. All right, let's talk about the factor selector. Remember, this um, tool is something that we use in my uh, Wednesday morning swing trading class. Slightly different than the sector selector that we use in my Monday morning class. Uh, but it kind of gives us a way to slice and dice the markets a little bit differently, help us uh, understand what's kind of taking place underneath the surface. We did have some um, kind of differences this week. Remember the, the prior week, we really didn't see any changes in the rankings. This week we did. Uh, this week we see momentum up there in the number one position all of a sudden. And as you can see, as you kind of track backwards with this orange ball, this is the first time in three months that momentum has been number one on the factor selector. So we're happy to see that because momentum had been kind of one of those holdouts this year. And remember momentum, all else being equal, is considered a more speculative um, area, more risk on area, because it's effectively price chasing, right? Trend trading, price chasing, fear of missing out, however you want to state that, it is momentum. And uh, momentum has struggled in 2022 uh, for the most part. So it's good to see them kind of finally get a little bit of time in the sun there after kind of being stuck in the shadows for so long. Uh, they did replace low size. Uh, up there at the top, but both of those two are probably the two most speculative of these six different factors. So it is a good sign for risk appetite that those two factors are leading the way in the market right now. On the downside, you did see value overtake um, dividend yield for the worst performer at this moment in time. Remember, those two had been doing well earlier in the year. In fact, exactly uh, three months ago, you can see dividend yield with this purple ball would have been number one and value would have been number two. Uh, my oh my, how much of a difference just three months make because now the, the top two are now the bottom two uh, as those areas are maybe um, areas that you kind of hunker down in a bit more when risk appetite is low. And so this is a good way to reflect the risk appetite right now. Your two most speculative factors are leading the way and a couple of your least speculative factors are on the downside. So this is more of a risk on market environment that we find ourselves in right now, at least from a factor perspective. Obviously there's a lot of different ways you can look at things, but from a factor perspective, I think you could make that interpretation at this exact moment in time. All right, let's go ahead and now pop back on over to the platform and let's do some 12 grid analysis. 
starting with chart 5A. This is our asset class 12 grid. And as you can see here, we do have more pink charts on the board than green charts. Remember, the pink charts are the ones that have bearish intermediate postures according to the market forecast. The green charts are the ones that have bullish postures according to the market forecast. And um, you, know, you can see here that uh, the bottom rung contains three out of four green charts here at this moment in time. And a couple of them have been kind of the, the, the market's boogeymen uh, here at various points during the year. And those are the kitty corner ones uh, of uh, the UUP for US dollar in the lower left hand corner. And then um, over here in this other corner, lower right, we've got TNX and that's your 10 year US Treasury yield. Now, both of them were actually down today. And that's part of the reason perhaps that we saw such a robust rally to the upside in the stock market. You know, the boogeyman got, got left behind here today. They, they got, uh, you know, left under the bed or wherever the boogeyman hides out. Uh, but uh, uh, the 10 year treasury yield did fall today um, and it did end up still above 3%, but um, it was only 3.02%. Uh, when it was all said and done. When I was in class earlier this morning, we were looking at it, it was at 3.12%. So it fell 10 basis points just during the, the, the intraday session. Um, and so that was um, something that allowed bonds to rally a bit here today. Notice that long-term treasuries had a pretty strong day. TLT was up 1.4% today, a good response to back-to-back -back oversold cluster signals. Does that sound familiar? It should because the same thing happened back here, right? We got this oversold cluster signal that started a pretty nice rally in bonds. Will we get as much of a rally this time around? I don't know. I never make that assumption, but could we get back up to the falling 30-day moving average on TLT? Sure. Uh, that would not surprise me at all. Foreign bonds also had a nice up session here today. They also had an oversold cluster signal yesterday, a great response reversion to the mean here up 0.63% today with the foreign bond market. And then not uh, to be outdone, take a look at what happened here with high yield bonds. They also rallied. They rallied 0.94% and are back to touching the rising moving average. Remember when I was making a point to point that out to you guys just two days ago? Well, uh, it's gotten even better since then. Because that day, the reason I was even talking about high yield bonds is because it's the only one of those three bond categories that was actually up that day because that was a day when oil was also up. Well, look at what's happened the last two days. High yield bonds have gone up two days in a row. Now that's a little bit more of a risk appetite move there as well because those are corporate bonds. And with the stock market up the last couple of days, it was a little bit easier for high yield junk bonds to go up than perhaps some government bonds. Uh, but nonetheless, you could get away with saying high yield bonds are the leaders from a bond perspective right now. And that's another way to take the risk appetite of the market. Market participants are willing to push into the junkiest corner of the bond market right now at a greater capacity than they're willing to go into some of these other so-called safer areas of the bond market. So I think that's a good sign for risk appetite in addition to what I just showed you there from a factor perspective a moment ago. Um, so you can also see, by the way, that HYG um, has a light pink background color, whereas foreign bonds and government bonds have dark pink background colors. So that's telling you that of these three charts, the one that's most likely to go to bullish first is going to be high yield bonds. And they could do it as soon as tomorrow. Um, and so be on the lookout for that possibility there. Uh, anyway, um, like what I see out of that from a risk appetite perspective. Let's talk about um, US dollar now. That's our chart in our lower left hand corner. And many of you know that the US dollar had gone on a tremendous run for about two weeks in a row. This is another thing that I pointed out on Tuesday and told you to put in the back of your mind, pin it, and make sure you keep an eye on it because we want to see how it handles things. And so far, so good. Remember, the, the conversation I had with you is look for the possibility of this representing some sort of a double top because it just so happened that Tuesday's rally and Monday's rally in the US dollar fell slightly short of breaching the high point of the candle on um, July 14th. Well, here we are two days later. Odds would have suggested that we'd have broke through that because there's a tremendous amount of positive energy that was going into that move. So 
the likelihood was that the momentum would continue to break to the upside. Well, here we are, and that you know thesis or, or the, the theory that I posed of the possible double top is still in play here. Um, again, I'm not going to get too rambunctious with my thought process there, uh, but uh, because this can easily break, we're very, very close to those highs. That could happen very quickly under the right types of market conditions. But hey, at least you're holding out hope. And uh, I personally would prefer to see the U.S. dollar weaken, not strengthen. Uh, I don't have any European vacations in front of me, so take it for what it's worth, uh, where the U.S. dollar could stretch a little bit more. But I am a stock market participant, and I've personally found it easier to operate within the stock market if the U.S. dollar is weak, not strong. Uh, then again, I'm kind of involved in a little bit more international, large cap, multinational types of blue chip securities. So, you know, uh, take it for what it's worth there. But I would say that's yet another sign that is in the bullish camp at this exact moment in time. That can be ruined as soon as tomorrow with Jackson Hole. But as of right now, I'm going to put that in the bullish category that we have yet to breach that high level on UUP going back there to mid-July. Um, and so with the falling dollar here today, gold was up just a little bit. Um, one fly in the ointment was oil was down, but remember, that's not necessarily a bad thing for the rest of the market. Sometimes you can look at that and say that that's good for risk appetite um, when, the, when oil is strong, but you can take that concept too far, and when oil is too strong, it eventually means that input costs um, and uh, will go up for a variety of you know shipping companies and you know quite frankly most companies right whether you're uh, a trucking company that's directly impacted by rising fuel costs an airline company that's directly impacted by rising f fuel costs or whether you're just a retailer like Target or um, you know Walmart they're not directly um, disadvantaged because they're not the ones driving the trucks but um, they are indirectly a disadvantage right if fuel prices continue to go up, um, you know, they, that's got to be offset somewhere else, perhaps by rising or raising the, the, the price of the goods that are sold at Target and Walmart. Some of you saw my tweet yesterday uh, where I was joking that getting dividends from Walmart uh, in mangoes these days, a little uh, money-saving tip for you there. If, if any of you are big mango fans like uh, my son and I are, we love to dehydrate them every summer. Um, Walmart's got a heck of a sale on of them right now, 88 cents. So that's my tip for you for the day. Uh, anyway, back to the stock market here. If you're Walmart and you're seeing your, your, your fuel costs going way up, you're probably going to have to offset that by you know increasing the prices of your goods that you're selling. And that might reduce the demand for those very goods. And so it kind of works on itself. So on a day like today, I actually don't mind that oil was down alongside the US dollar because that's kind of giving some of that extra juice to the rest of the sectors out there outside of oil and gas. Um, so anyway, um, kind of a mixed bag there, I guess you could say today between commodities with gold up and oil down. On the, on the flip side, where the dollar can really have a big impact is on foreign securities. And take a look at what happened to EEM today. Holy mackerel, EEM was up 2.16% today. Uh, if we thought we had a big move out of the US markets, emerging markets uh, even did better. And look at that reaction. We closed basically at the high of the session on EEM. It was so strong that we now have turned the background color of the chart to dark green, right? It's separating itself from what we see out of EFA and SPY over here. In addition to that, today's move was so aggressive, it pushed that moving average up ever further. And now price above a rising moving average, we are back to a green moving average and a green background. So strongly bullish intermediate posture and price above a rising 30-day moving average, that's a pretty bullish combination right there. Um, we can't make the same claims for EFA or for SPY yet. I did see a number of Chinese companies like uh, Alibaba doing pretty well here today with some supportive uh, commentary from the Chinese government. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's probably playing a big role as to why EEM did so well today comparatively. But regardless of the reason, 
it, it happened, right? Who cares what the reason is? Uh, you know, the, the, the price activity, uh, you know, is telling the truth, so to speak, right? Price is truth. So uh, keep your eyes on that because the emerging markets have kind of sat out this party for quite a long time. And if they're about ready to get into the habit of joining the party, then there's some makeup ground that they could have to the upside. There's a lot of emerging markets individual stocks that could very well be interesting candidates to the upside. Um, remember when I did that uh, bearish trade on uh, JD.com, I was pretty giddy about that one because it was a rare case where uh, I did a short sale uh, the night before and the very next morning it gapped down to my target price. Some of you will recall that trade. Well, anyway, it almost seems like the opposite's happening now. I didn't even check JD today, but I'm assuming it was up nicely. Let's go ahead and look at it here real quick. And yeah, look at JD. It's been up three days and actually four days in a row, but the last three in particular have been pretty aggressive days. So all of a sudden, JD is breaking out above some of these prior resistance areas uh, and is kind of trying to head back towards those highs. And if you look at BABA, it's kind of the same thing, but not as aggressive. But they've had really nice back-to-back -back sessions there as well. But there's a lot of catch-up. If, if all of a sudden emerging markets are going to come into favor, then a chart like BABA, you might start targeting where it was trading just back in early July, and you could have some pretty decent percentage points between those two numbers. So let's keep our eyes on EEM. That's telling us something different than what the market was telling us earlier this year. Most of the time, EEM had been a laggard. But all of a sudden here, right here, right now, we're seeing EEM is starting to establish a little bit more leadership. So let's see where that takes us as well. All right, let's go ahead and now take a look here at our um, chart 5C. This is our US sectors 12 grid. And it's a little bit more of a mixed bag here once again. And remember, it wasn't so long ago that we had a clean sweep of green across the board. That's no longer the case because all indicators are lagging to some degree, but the posture setting mechanism that we use from the market forecast technical indicator is looking at kind of a multi-month trading period. And so there's a little bit more of a lag that's taking place there. So the markets have done very nicely the last two days, but because the stocks themselves were down for about a week and a half to two weeks here more recently, we just haven't seen enough of a robust response to turn the postures around quite yet. So there's a little bit of a delay there. But if the markets can stay bullish, uh, including tomorrow and then into early next week, I would expect that many of these pink charts would probably turn back to green at that time. So, you know, it just is a little bit of a delayed response there. Nonetheless, it gives us an opportunity to see what are the better looking charts um, a little bit easier because that green really stands out. And right now we've got industrials, we've got utilities, and we've got energy as those leadership areas. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure those are the ones that we were just talking about on Tuesday when I was talking about the, um, the, the, the sector selector. Let me just verify that because I don't want to give you guys the wrong information there. Let's come on over here to the sector selector. And you can see that utilities, energy, and industrials were one, two, and three. And remember, I put this together last Friday, so it had uh, no impact of whatever has been happening in the stock market this week. But just goes to show that that is confirming evidence there. Some people don't wanna believe in those particular areas for whatever reason, right? Maybe they think utilities are too boring, or maybe they're big environmentalists and they don't wanna believe that oil and gas stocks have upside uh, price activity, or whatever their reason may be. Right, but what we are seeing factually through the actual evidence is that there are uh, there is strength in those particular areas. So this is good to see that those three happen to be the exact three that were leading the way on the sector selector last weekend. They continue to be quite robust. In fact, uh, you could almost go as far as saying that they're starting to become too hot. Uh, in the case of industrials, you actually have an overbought cluster signal here all of a sudden, and this is the first one. Um, that they've had in at least three months. Remember, for those of you that are premium members, this is chart 5C. If you come in and right click on one of those miniature charts and then go to maximize sell, you can then see the market forecast technical indicator down below that will align with those red and green dots that you see out there. So like back here on the industrials XLI, um, this was an oversold cluster when all three of those colored lines were in the low reversal zone at the same time. And no surprise, we got a reversion to the mean move to the upside. 
Will the opposite happen here? Hard to say. A lot of times what we've seen in the past is that if you are getting a red overbought cluster early in the trend, it's not something to fear. In fact, sometimes it actually ends up being a good thing. It's later in the trend where you continually get those red dots appearing that becomes a little bit more problematic. My, my own experience with clusters is I trust the oversold clusters personally more than I trust the overbought clusters. Part of that might simply be because the markets usually have a very supportive Fed. And right now we have the opposite of that. So we have to be careful with that notion. But in general, I'm a little bit more willing to be brave and go bullish at a time of oversold conditions as opposed to being brave and going bearish at a time of overbought conditions because overbought can lead to even further overbought. So who knows if this leads to anything, but just thought I would point that out just in the off chance that it does start to spell a little bit of a slowdown there in some of those industrial names that have done so well here in the last month or so. So um, industrial's up 1.53% today. Um, the best performing sector today was actually technology. Actually, I take that back. Just to the left of that, communications was up 1.95% today. They still have a strongly bearish posture. So a lot of this 1.95% rebound today could be viewed as a little bit of a dead cat bounce because this thing suffered so dramatically in the last couple of weeks. Whereas I think the technology chart looks a little bit better. It wasn't that much far behind communications today. It was up 1.69% today. And this is again, exactly what you wanna see. You know, you had a very strong market and eventual give back is inevitable. You had that give back. How it responds to the give back is important and it's responding nobly here today. Uh, and we closed at the high of the session there for technology bouncing up and off of that rising 30 day moving average. So I like, to, I like what I see there. Um, in terms of who the worst performing sector was here today, uh, it was probably Staples. Let me just verify that. So it was up 0.46%. Yep, that was it. That was the worst performer. Uh, actually did pretty well, all things considered. I figured it would be um, barely in the green, given what I saw out of the heat map earlier in the session. Uh, but this is still an, an okay day. Uh, being up a half a percent is a decent day for the staples. So, um, you know, it wasn't a terrible performance, but it is true that they were the laggard here today. Let's go ahead and now um, talk about our trade application example. And I want, before we go over to the other charts, for you to just um, recognize what's taking place here with real estate. Um, we're having kind of that nice give back, bounce up and off of the rising 30 day moving average on real estate as a whole. Um, that will be helpful to set the table, so to speak, when I bring up our trade application example now. So let me now go over here to uh, chart 3A. And we actually had this conversation yesterday. So if you are a premium member, hopefully those of you that enjoy swing trading were in my swing trading class yesterday morning because you would have already been on top of this a day in advance. But yesterday, one of the things I was sharing with my students in that class is I was impressed as I went through hundreds of charts that morning like I typically do on Wednesday mornings before the class. And uh, one thing that caught my eye was repeatedly over and over and over again REIT charts were setting up for nice bullish bounce candidates. And the two charts that we looked at yesterday in class uh, where we kind of uh, talked through some various trade ideas were PLD. And um, you can see that PLD uh, not only continued to rally yesterday after my class into the close of yesterday, but they continued to rally again today. Uh, and then the other one that we looked at was Vici. That's the Las Vegas um, uh, REIT that, that controls a, a big chunk of the Las Vegas Strip with a lot of those casinos. And same thing, where you had a nice follow through here today on Vici properties. But it seemed like as I was going through chart after chart after chart yesterday morning, many of them were these REITs that were kind of giving you those types of setups. Another one we talked about was uh, was DRE. This is Duke Realty. It's getting bought out by Prologis, so it's going to look quite similar to Prologis. But we were looking at these charts that were giving us these cahold patterns. For those of you that aren't familiar with that technology or that that, that terminology, uh, cahold is uh, just an acronym, and it stands for close above the high of the low day. 
And for a lot of these REITs, their setup was the same, where they had these really strong givebacks of like four or five days in a row down to the upward trending 30-day moving average. And then they started using that moving average as a support bounce area. And so um, we had the close of yesterday above the high of the low day, which was the day before. And then we have a continuation beyond that. So you can see that this is a pretty nice looking bullish um, swing trading setup. You know, it might not be the best trend trades out there or what have you, but from a, uh, a swing trading perspective, if you're more of a bounce trader, this is the type of activity that you like to see. So those ones have played out pretty nicely since yesterday morning's class, and I wanted to kind of continue that concept here a day later. Now keep in mind, because we are a day later, sometimes that is the difference between success and failure as a swing trader, so you have to be careful uh, with that as well. Naturally, you would have been better off taking these uh, bullish REIT trades yesterday as opposed to today, but you know um, the, the setup is still there in some of the cases. So I was going through a bunch of the REIT charts again today in preparation of this presentation here tonight, and I came down to a couple of them. I actually wrote down about um, seven or eight of them that I thought were, were interesting enough that I could have presented. But the two that I came down to, I'll show you the honorable mention one first. This is actually a dividend aristocrat, a rare REIT on the aristocrat list. This is Essex Property Trust. This is an apartment REIT company. And I kind of like this setup because it's the same type of deal where you've got this strong pullback to the rising 30-day moving average, and then you've got this bounce up and off of it. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't feel like yesterday, by missing yesterday, was a big hindrance. Uh, because yesterday it kind of closed in the middle of the prior day's range. So there's a little bit more hesitation there on this chart than on those other two that I showed you that I did present to the class yesterday. So today could have actually been that close above the high of the low day or at least right around there. Um, I also like the fact that you had a bit of a, um, a bullish um, near-term divergence signal on this one. It's hard to see naturally, but you do have a low there on the blue line. You have a slightly higher low right there, and at the same time you have lower price activity. So you have a little bit more bullishness underneath the hood than somebody who's just looking at the price activity um, is, is recognizing. But the reason I chose not to go with this one in the end is as you can see, it has been an underperformer versus the market at large. The S&P 500's dotted line up above here uh, is well above this company's price candles. And so that was kind of the deciding factor for me. I don't know if it's good, bad, or otherwise. Um, one of the things I would have liked about Essex is I would have put the stop loss just a couple pennies below the low of a couple days ago, and therefore all it would take is just one quick little pop higher before we get to our reward area. So I did like that aspect of it. So it was a little bit tough for me to decide here today, but this is the one that I kind of decided to sit out on, but I'm mentioning it here in case some of you guys like that setup as well. Maybe some of you will like this one better than the one that I actually did do. So let's talk about the one that I did do now. And that was REXR. This is Rexford Industrial Realty. This is a company that we've talked about occasionally in my top-down trend trading class in the past. So some of you might be familiar with it, but it's, a, it's an industrial REIT. And uh, it's got the same type of setup with a lot of those other REITs that I've showed you, where we had that really strong four or five day uh, pullback to the rising 30 day moving average, found stability at that moving average, and started bouncing up and off of it yesterday. You know, yesterday would have been a better day to get in it than today, so there is that. And as I mentioned before, you know, uh, one day is important as a swing trader. So uh, could that be the, the failure of this trade? Possibly. Um, you know, some of you may have caught it on your own yesterday. Who knows, right? It's a crazy world out there. But we did have our hold pattern as of yesterday's close. Today we had a continuation kind of follow through beyond that. And the reason I chose to go with this one as opposed to Essex is because this one you could get away with saying is a market beating security. Not by much, but just barely. Notice that the dotted S&P 500 gold line is just a hair below where this stock closed here today. So it has performed a bit better uh, on this three month chart. It's up about 6%, whereas Essex must have been up less than that. Yeah, Essex was only up fractionally, 0.35%. So it's been an underperformer on a three month basis. So for those of you that like the concept of relative strength, then 
Rexford is probably a little bit more interesting to you than uh, Essex. But for those of you that like the bullish near-term divergence signals, then the opposite is true. Then Essex might be a little bit more interesting than this one. So kind of depends. Uh, you kind of get a two-for-one opportunity tonight when you're watching my presentation. And you can decide for yourself uh, if any of them look better than the other or if you're just going to take a hard pass on them. And that's fine as well. Remember, there's plenty of fish in the sea. There's always another train leading the station, as they say. So if there's ever any of these trades that David and I present to you that just don't float your boat, uh, there is no shame in just taking a pass on those and waiting for better setups to come your way. Uh, but that was kind of the reasoning behind it. I like what I see out of the real estate sector in general, the last 24 to 48 hours, many of them are bouncing up and off of their rising moving averages. And so I just figured, hey, let's try to play it as a swing trade. Now, because this one does not have liquid options, it does trade options, but they're not liquid, I just chose to do a straight stock trade here. So basically just bought 100 shares um, and put our stop loss down here below this candle from, um, from August 4th. Uh, so as long as it stays above the lows of that candle, this trade should be good to go. And then our price target on a one for one reward risk relationship would push us up here just a little bit below 68, which means that we do not have to break out above 68, 68 to get to our, our payday. We, we would get out before then just in case there's a big seller up in that particular area. So that's what I had for you here today, a bullish swing trade to the upside on an industrial REIT here, which is giving us a nice hold pattern yesterday. It's got a nice uh, blue background color telling us that we have a bullish near-term posture right now, even though it doesn't have the divergent signal. And it does have a green moving average telling us that price is above its rising 30-day moving average. Okay, so that's what I had for you. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Very interesting day in the market to say the least, and I would say a, a very constructive day for the bulls. Let's hope the Fed doesn't ruin the party tomorrow in Jackson Hole. But I really like today's trade activity uh, across the board. It felt like more of a risk on day, strong breadth across the board, bounces exactly where you want them to be. It almost feels like it's too good to be true. So we gotta be careful there as well. Sometimes when the markets give you that setup, it's like, yep, we're gonna go ahead and fool everybody at the same time now. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if they do that to us this time around. But all in all, I think it was a very healthy day for the bulls. So with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and wrap things up here. Remember, if you got value out of this presentation tonight, I ask one simple request out of you, just click like for us there on Twitter. As long as we're up and over 100 likes by the time I'm scheduled to do the video again on Tuesday, I'll give you another full-length video, including a trade application example like the one I just showed you here. If we're under 100 likes, then I'll just plan on doing a quick hitter 15-minute video on only the indices themselves. So I'll let you guys decide collectively on that, but I want to wish you all a great weekend. Uh, David will be with you again tomorrow, uh, but I'll be uh, off until Tuesday for most of you. Of course, I've got my premium students uh, in two classes on Monday, so I'll see many of you there as well. But I hope you all enjoy your nice summer weekend, and we'll see you all next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.